Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to keep on sitting here, otherwise I'm just going to start pacing around and that's not going to be so good for the camera. So if you feel free to come closer if you can't see me well. So I'll just start by saying something about my undergraduate education. So I studied archaeology and art history uh, before I realizing that I actually wasn't interested in doing real archaeology, you know, going out in the cold and the wet and the rain. And one of the things that always struck me in archaeology is how much skilled perception is involved. So, for instance, when you see a decoloration in the ground, then as a novice, it's totally impossible to know what the decoloration is. So if you have an archaeological site and you see a decoloration, what could it be? It could be the activity of worms. It could be a different kind of stone. Or it could actually be the traces of human activity. There could be a wall under if you dig just a bit deeper. And actually, skilled archaeologists, and unfortunately, I never got to that level of skill, they can tell you immediately, yeah, this is promising. Keep on digging. So I've often wondered, what are these skilled perceptions? How do we, what do we do with them? What do they tell us? So now, and as you'll see, there's quite some archaeological examples here. Um, I'm going to reflect on these uh, skilled forms of perception. It's not just archaeology. There's various forms of skilled perception. So radiologists, for example, if you have a, a typical uh, X-ray, it has these very minute differences in grayscale. And on the basis of that, well, radiologists can make an informed judgment about what's going on, uh, make a diagnosis. Birders can distinguish between very similar looking birds. Gemologists can distinguish between a real diamond and a fake diamond very easily. They say, oh, look at the brilliance and the clarity, etc. They can give you a ballpark figure about how much a diamond would be worth, that sort of thing. Now, these are all perceptual seemings. There's also intellectual seemings. Mathematicians, for example, have provability intuitions. So they see a theorem and they think, yeah, that could be proven before they actually do the work and start proving the theorem. And similarly, a Kant scholar can have intuitions about, say, the Syrian refugee crisis. What would Kant have to say about that? About what our response should be or a governmental response should be? A Kant scholar can have these seemings about Kant, the Kantian response that this should be that. So I'm going to give, uh, as a rough definition, which is on your handout, for S to have a scaled seeming that P in domain D is for S to form a non-inferential belief that P as a result of her expertise gained in D following some stimulus or problem posed in D. So for example, say that I'm a birder. I'm not a birder, but anyway. Um, and I'm looking at birds and then I see a green warbler. Then I don't have to infer it's a green warbler. I just see that it's a green warbler in the same way that another person might say, that's a bird, a little green bird. I can say, that's a green warbler, following some stimulus or problem. So it's non-inferential. Now the question is, are we justified in saying, yeah, it's a green warbler, or this is really a trace that uh, denotes human activity in the case of the archaeologist? Uh, I'm going to say yes, but I think that there's important differences between skilled and ordinary seamings. So one of the things I hope to get your feedback on is whether you have the same idea about this and what you think in general about this. Now, there's been quite some discussion about uh, seemings and their justification in general. Uh, and frequently, discussions on justification of perception in the literature frequently lump together skilled and ordinary seemings. And there's several examples of this, and I've given examples here in the handout. But I think one of the clearest examples is the following. It's an example from Markey of two gold diggers who go prospecting for gold. Suppose that we are prospecting for gold. You have learned to identify a golden nugget on site, but I have no such knowledge. As the water washes out of my pan, we both look at a pebble, which is in fact a gold nugget. 
My desire to discover gold makes it seem to me as if the pebble is gold. Your learned identification skills make it seem that way to you. According to phenomenal conservatism, PC, the belief that it is gold has prima facie justification for both of us, because that's after all what phenomenal conservatism says, that there is this prima facie justification in the absence of any further justification. Yet certainly my wishful thinking should not gain my perceptual belief the same positive epistemic status of the visible justification as your learned identification skills. And I think that last sentence is exactly right. Indeed, we have to have some sort of account of uh, perception and justification, or broadly seeming, since I'm also looking at intellectual seemings, uh, that gives you the right sort of intuitions about uh, why the person who has learned to identify gold is justified in their beliefs, and the person who just merely wishful thinks, wishfully hopes that it's going to be gold, is not justified. So I'll I want to draw this distinction between skilled and ordinary seemings. Now at first blush, the phenomenology is very similar. In fact, um, as you're reading this handout, it's very, when you read, it's very similar to when you see something. It's not that you're looking and you say, oh, this is a squiggle, it's going to be an S. So it's non-inferential, it feels spontaneous, it feels natural. Um, so if you have, say, um, language, natural language, and I say, Anna had fewer bread than Miguel, that doesn't sound right for a native English speaker. You don't have to think about why it doesn't sound, it just doesn't sound right to you. And similarly, if you're a trained Baroque musician, then you will know that parallel thirds are a no-go for Baroque music. Parallel thirds are, are not permitted in Baroque music. So when you hear parallel thirds and you think, nah, this is not, this is not a good ba Baroque harmonization, in a similar way. But this shared phenomenology actually masks a very different developmental trajectory the trajectory by which we acquire ordinary language is very different from the trajectory by which we acquire these skilled seemings. So ordinary seemings arise stably across cultures. So typically, take for instance, an example of ordinary seemings would be ordinary perception, um, say face perception. Lots of cultures have face perception. There's no artifacts or institutional support needed Take, for instance, language acquisition. Um, again, some people think that it would be helpful to teach children language extra in the way of videos, such as Baby Einstein, whatever it's called. But these things don't really help. It doesn't really speed up their language. What really helps is talking a lot. But you don't need this sort of extra institutional artifactual support to get the skill going. It just arises as a part of ordinary cognitive development. So the brain matures in a certain way, and obviously there's ways to frustrate that. So there's been experiments in the 1970s with cats that were put in these rooms where it's only vertical lines. And it really messed up the orientation selective cells in their visual system. So those cats, uh, they came out completely messed up. Uh, the, I don't know if they still do this sort of experiment, but basically, you really need special circumstances to override uh, people acquiring ordinary seemings. So ordinary uh, native speaker intuitions are an example of ordinary seemings as is ordinary visual perception. By contrast, skilled seemings are very variable across cultures. So take, for example, writing and reading. There's lots of cultures that have reading and writing, but they're very differently organized in different cultures. And until recently, we didn't have the kind of literacy that we have now, very high amounts of literacy in each culture. Even a hundred years ago in a culture like this, literacy was a lot lower. You have re writing that goes from left to right, and then from right to left, and characters look very different. There are very different processes involved. And unlike with ordinary seemings, you really do need to deliberately practice in a scaffolded environment. So there, the training does help. The tr extra training does help. And it alters your cognitive development. So for instance, people who are literate, 
which is each of us, have different brain organization compared to people who are uh, literate adults but only learned to le read and write as adults. So people have done these comparisons in Portugal with uh, adults who either learned to read and write at school or adults who were, uh, as children, kept home very early in order to help in the household and in the farms. And it turns out that uh, actually people who um, are literate have uh, less uh, white matter. Um, so there's, this, there's these different developmental trajectories. So you have all sorts of different skilled seemings, and there's lots of skilled seemings that you just won't have. Well, this is what it is to have a skilled seeming if you uh, are not trained. This is why amateur archaeologists who go and help out in the summer will frequently mistake the activity of worms or just a decoloration that has to do with different types of stone for human activity, whereas an archaeologist, a trained archaeologist, will not make that mistake. Numismatic perceptions, like looking at a coin and immediately knowing, yeah, this is definitely Tiberius. So that's the kind of skills that I'm talking about. Now, this distinction between skilled and ordinary seemings is somewhat similar, but not identical to Thomas Reed's distinction between ordinary and acquired perception. So Reed uh, talked about this um, in his 7064 book that I temporarily forgot the title about. So he says that all original perception is perception that is natural and original, whereas uh, acquired perception is the fruit of our experience. And he gives several nice examples, such as you have shipbuilders and they look in the distance and they can see a ship and they know the make of the ship, and they know what year it was built. Or you have um, a butcher who sees hams hanging at hooks and knows how heavy these hams might be, whereas for a layperson that wouldn't be, they wouldn't be able to tell you. However, Reed also thinks that things that you acquire very easily, such as distinguishing the smell of an orange or the smell of an apple, he thinks that those things are acquired too. And that original perception are the things where there's absolutely no learning, no, uh, no acquisition involved. So, for example, uh, seeing different edges. And, uh, so if you have visual perception, I might have to learn that this is a chair, but my original perception would tell me, would tell, let me know where the edges of that chair are, for example. So I want to draw this distinction slightly differently because Acquiring knowledge about different artifacts is really easy. It doesn't require this sort of institutional support and it's lots of training. So I'm going to call that ordinary seemings, whereas skilled seemings are the seemings where you really need to put in lots of work and training, where your cognitive development is altered. So how, whoops, how do we learn skills? I think that one thing that is involved when we learn st skills is a fundamental trust in other people's knowing how. There's a long literature in this in cognitive psychology that humans have a fundamental trust, especially in how adults do things. So this is uh, developmental psychological research, uh, for example, of overimitation in children. Um, and in these experiments, what you have is a box. Here it would be nice to have had a video, but anyway, just try to imagine it. So you have a box, and the box has a number of complex actions. You have to push something out of the way of the box, you have to probe something inside the box, and then you have to pull open a door, and a reward will appear. So people demonstrate how this box works to young children and to chimpanzees, and then they repeat the action and the chimpanzees will imitate the action. So there's been this long debate about can chimpanzees imitate? Well, apparently they can uh, in order to get this reward. Then there's a second version of the box. But in this, this particular version, the box is transparent. And then you can clearly see that all the actions that you've been doing are just pointless because there is a hidden compartment, a hidden floor in the box. So all the actions that you do at the top of the box don't impact the bottom of the box where the reward comes out. Now what happens then is that chimpanzees will just open the little door and get out a reward, but children will still do all these actions of 
pushing the levers, etc., at the top of the box, even though it doesn't do a thing. So they over-imitate. Lest you think, oh, well, children are gullible. This is not something adults do. Adults also over-imitate. In several experiments, adults also do. Useless actions clearly look useful, uh, useless. They continue to do it. They've done it in different cultures because, you know, maybe this is a result of schooling and that adults are just sort of bullied into submission of, you know, always doing exactly as teachers tell you. But they've done it in cultures where there's very little schooling. Australian Aboriginals, uh, Kung, uh, hunter-gatherers, and they had similar results, so they also over-imitated. So this is really uh, a crucial feature of how we learn skills, is that we trust that other people are doing things and in fact, it makes sense to do it that way. If you think of the Burke expedition in Australia, so the Burke expedition was a bunch of Victorian English people, and they went in the Australian inland, and they had lots of stuff along, so they were very well equipped. But they started getting dysentery and dying, and the reason was that they didn't cook some or other plant that was quite ubiquitous sufficiently, and that actually takes out the poisonous stuff in the plant. Uh, but local uh, Aborigines did do that, and so they just didn't know, they didn't realize. So sometimes it looks like there's no point in actually cooking this food, cooking these seeds, but actually it can save your life. So there's a good evolutionary rationale. So how does this happen on a neural level? This is something that people have been researching recently. So they've looked at things such as chess, music and sports. Sports is always a bit tricky because most of these studies are fMRI, so that means that you can't move that much in fMRI, if you know, so you can't really have football players in action, but they do other things, such as they show football players videos, and then they have to press buttons, depending on the response that they would do. And so all this research on expertise and the brain has given a few interesting results. So. Um, Actually, there is no dedicated expertise network. We don't have a dedicated network in the brain that is exclusively doing expert stuff. But interestingly, we do have a novice network that has uh, frontal and temporal regions, parietal regions. Um, and the novice network basically is involved in attentional control. It helps you say that you're not good at baking cakes, um, so you're just at the early stages of learning to bake cakes. So you then have to really try to keep track of, OK, you now first I break the eggs, and then I put it in the flour, and then I whisk it around. And so it helps you to keep track. So it's basically working memory and attentional control. The sort of thing that's also active when you do Stroop tasks, you know, the Stroop task where you have to say green when it's a red word. But uh, or is that the other way around? Yes, yeah, the other way around. So, um, so there's no expert network. So what happens after a while, when people get better and better at the expert task, you see that the uh, activity in the net novice network decreases. So there's been a couple of uh, empirical studies about that. Uh, for example, linear algebra. So children and adults were taught how to do linear algebra. And you see that uh, the uh, the novice network uh, becomes less active. Of course, something has to become more active, and it seems that these are just different kinds of brain parts, depending on neural areas, depending on the task involved. Very often, specialized neuronal systems with older phylogenetic functions are recycled. This is what how Dehana calls it, Stanislas Dehana calls it, neuronal ne recycling. They're recycled for a novel task. So, for example, car and bird experts use the fusiform and occipital face areas, which are normally involved in face recognition. And if you think about it, it makes sense because, well, faces, they look very similar in many respects, but there's these little differences between faces, like how close the eyes are together and that sort of thing. And that helps you distinguish between different faces. So it's not so surprising that that helps you distinguish between different kinds of birds or different kinds of dogs or different kinds of cars. And in fact, um, uh, Gauthier and her team have been able to uh, 
show that even for a novel non-existing category of objects called greebles, so greebles are these kind of squiggles. Oh yeah, maybe I can draw a greeble. So I'm going to try to draw, draw a greeble. Hmm. Right. So you have a sort of, so you have these, you have to imagine this is 3D. And they look very similar, but they've got a few differences. Um, and there's a lot of them. And you have to be able to distinguish them all. It takes a while. And as people are getting better and better at distinguishing the greebles, their uh, face areas, fusiform and occipital face areas, uh, increase in activity. Now, I'm interested in the question of whether scaled seemings are justified, prima facie. Can we prima facie trust them? And it seems to me the answer is yes. I'm still struggling with the first part of this. So I've got three possible ways of looking at whether skilled seemings can be justified. The first two have been recently discussed a lot in the literature, epistemology literature, of ordinary perception, namely dogmatism in its many forms, um, the phenomenal evidence argument, and the third one uh, that you see on the handout, the displays of discriminatory virtuosity, is one that was specifically proposed by Kitcher for the seemings that scientists have in many domains. So I'm first going to look at these two general ones, and then going to look at Kitcher, and let's see what we think about it. So dogmatism is the idea that when it perceptually seems to you as if P is the case, you have a kind of justification for believing P simply by virtue of having an experience as if P. So you get this sort of peculiar phenomenological experience which Humer terms forcefulness or Tucker terms assertiveness. And I'm not clear yet in how far we can use this to think about skilled seemings. It seems to me that there is often something like that going on. So often when, you're, when you have a certain skill, there is this sort of gut feeling that sometimes plays a role, like the coin expert who says, this is definitely Tiberius. I'm strong, I've got a strong feeling this is not Augustus, but Tiberius, for example, look quite similar. But in many cases, skilled perceivers don't seem to ac always accord the same sort of prima facie evidential value to their perceptual seemings. And that's something to take into account. So take, for example, Micropasts. Micropasts is a big online project where various experts, archaeologists, amateurs, uh, collectors, um, are crowdsourcing. So you have certain coins that are put up and then people give their idea about what's, what's the date of this coin, what's the emperor of this coin, uh, and how confident do I feel um, about uh, my idea about this? And on the basis of that, they sort of crowdsource these seemings uh, that um, coin collectors and coin fanatics have. And it seems to me that this sort of cross-checking doesn't happen quite as much as with ordinary seeming. It's not the case that I'm going to say, hey, is this really a banknote or something like that, which is what you would have as an equivalent, or is this really a chair? Whereas it does seem quite natural to say, is this really a Tiberius? So it doesn't seem to me that it's the same kind of quali quality that you have as uh, evidential value as it comes to skilled seemings. So second line of looking at how skilled seemings could be justified is the phenomenal evidence argument. And this argument was developed by Susanna Schellenberg in several papers, where she argues that perceptual states provide evidence due to their metaphysical structure. So she tries to avoid sort of um, reliabilism. So with reliabilism, you'd have to know how reliable, say that for instance, you're a reliabilist about visual perception, how reliable is my vision? And on the basis of that, you're going to make an argument about whether you can 
prima facie trust, the testimony of your senses, as it's called. Well, she says, we can actually do without this sort of realism by just looking at um, how they're metaphysically structured. And for that, you don't need to know how well the particular uh, perceptual apparatus works. So she argues that bad cases of perception, such as illusions and hallucinations, are parasitic on good cases. So say that I'm looking uh, in front of me a uh, uh, nice turnout for a lecture on a not so very good hour of the day, um, then I'm just using my ordinary visual skills and they pick out things in my environment such as faces, so I've got face recognition that deals with that and I see clothes and that sort of thing. I see all these different things um, and that gives me evidence. Now it could well be that you're a hallucination, uh, a philosophical hallucination because of course real hallucinations are quite different, but a philosophical hallucination which is just as you know, vivid, etc., as a, as a real perception, it's still going to be evidence of some nature, but it's, it's a bad case of perception. But it's still parasitic on me being able to pick out from the environment good cases of actual people. So that's how uh, you can trust the testimony of your senses because there's going to always be this asymmetry. Now, I think that in some cases of uh, skilled seeming, this is indeed the case. So you have, for instance, uh, people who use the soroban, which is a kind of a bacchus that is used in Japan, and people go really quick, 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 quick. So they, 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 can, uh, they work with it very quickly. They can immediately tell what it is. Um, and it's interesting, you can actually uh, really mess them up, uh, you know, if you give them numbers and then you give sort of pictures of Abacus configurations that are not consonant with the numbers, then they're going to have difficulties recalling these numbers, etc. So it really influences them. But even so, if an Abacus reader makes a mistake, it's still going to be dependent on their skill of doing the Abacus calculations. And there's many such situations, like the archaeologists say, the archaeologists who has, makes a mistake, and it's in fact the activity of worms and not an actual wall down there it's still going to be dependent on the skills that she learned as an archaeologist in training of how to discover through decolorations that walls are beneath the ground. However, the problem with that is that some skills just don't have any good cases ever. Take aura readers. So aura readers are supposed to send something about somebody's emotional state or whatever on the basis of a sort of colored halo that surrounds them. And aura readers, at least, well, they say that they actually really do perceive these things. But there are never any good cases. So there have been, like with every kind of parapsychology, people have actually tried to test this by putting a screen in front of people and then asking the aura readers, what do you perceive? And they just, they aren't even able to tell if there's somebody behind the screen or not, which is what you would expect with a screen that's not transparent. So there's just not ever going to be a good case of aura reading on which the bad cases of aura reading are going to be dependent because there's only bad cases of aura reading. And this is a problem for many skilled seemings that turned out not to be, well, people didn't see anything actually. Take palmistry, take phrenology. So you had phrenologists who came to your house and who probed your skull and this was a whole skill sort of feeling about your uh, devotion to your children and your mathematical talent and so forth. And there was just never any good case on which this is dependent because phrenology is utterly debunked. So we don't know if we are in epistemically good situations of a skilled seeming that has good cases. When we're asking about skilled seemings, you'd have to first say, this is actually a practice that has good cases. And that seems to me problematic for using this argument uh, for skilled seemings. It seems to me easier to make this argument for ordinary seemings uh, given that this is just ordinary human perception, probably came about through some evolutionary process. And so it seems that there are always going to be good cases. Now, the third way is Kitcher's displays of discriminatory virtuosity. So Kitcher wonders about um, scientific practice. You have many scientific practices where you have uh, scientists who can see stuff, 
uh, that you really only learn through experience. For example, you have a baboon uh, troop. This is the example he gives. So you have a baboon troop, and these baboons are sort of a big jumble of monkeys. They're running around. Uh, they're plucking at each other's fur. This is what a novice sees. By contrast, a baboon expert sees dominance hierarchies, sees a subdominant male trying to divert the attention of the alpha male, maybe trying to copulate with the subdominant female, that sort of thing. But if you're not, um, if you're not a baboon specialist, you just don't see it. So suppose that you're uh, training to become a primatologist. You spent many hours together with the expert baboon uh, person. And eventually you see it. You start seeing, ah, that's the alpha male and that sort of thing. But how do you know that's what you're actually doing? Because your being able to recognize this depends on a sort of institutionalized skill. So you could sort of have a viciously circular scientific practice. How do we get out of this? And actually, this is not a, a completely uh, arcane concern. So there's been a couple of cases where it does seem that archaeological practice, for example, is in this way viciously circular. One example uh, is a study from the 1970s called Millie's Camp. So Millie's Camp, what you had was you had the new archaeology in the 1960s, and people on the basis of new archaeology was this sort of ambitious archaeology, being able to look at not just you know, actual pots and pans and that sort of thing, but actually being able to talk about religion and about social structures, etc., all on the basis of archaeological evidence. So they saw this Native American camp, and on the basis of the remains that they found, they postulated uh, the composition of the household, uh, the fact that they had horses, the fact that they had certain religious rituals that they did. Um, and then they actually met uh, somebody who had lived in the camp just a few months before, so they could actually test all this stuff, and it was humiliating. It was just all wrong. Everything they could have gotten wrong, they got wrong. Uh, so, for example, the composition of the family was completely off. The, the religious symbols were actually just doodles made by a child, they didn't have horses, so the horse manure that was there must have come in after they left the camp. So everything was wrong. So how do we, how do we mitigate that? Well, Kitsch has, um, has two possible ways in which we can do that. So he first he talks, and he calls this together, this place of discriminatory virtuosity. So you sort of show and tell. So you, rather than just saying you show and tell, look, uh, I can do things, I can predict things that you wouldn't be able to predict without presupposing that there is a skill at work. So, for example, the baboon, um, the baboon expert sees these baboons scurrying around and say, look, now this baboon's going to run away and, uh, you know, make a whole spectacle and start screaming. And it actually happens. So if there's predictions like that and they come through, then you can say, yeah, this person actually knows something about baboons and they're using the skill to do this. And next to that, you have a convergence of findings in the face of different methodologies. And I think perhaps one of the most impressive examples of this is the convergent results on theory of mind in uh, chimpanzees that have been reached by uh, people who work in Kyoto and people who work in uh, Germany. Um, in the Max Planck uh, Institute. So they do it very differently. They, uh, the Max Planck Institute houses the chimpanzees uh, together according to age groups. The Japanese group uh, houses them as mothers with uh, infants. The Japanese have much more contact with the chimpanzees, uh, whereas the uh, group in uh, the Max Planck Institute is very sort of aloof and they want to keep the chimpanzees in a sort of as natural state as possible, so they have also more like zoo context, whereas Kyoto is a real lab context. They have very different ideas about humans and animals and how they relate to each other. Maybe there are even religious backgrounds that play a role. The Christian sort of idea in um, 
Western primatology, that there's this sort of strict division, the more Buddhist sort of ideas and Shinto ideas about more continuity. And nevertheless, they have striking findings such as uh, ways that chimpanzees uh, socially transmit uh, information, the lack of shared attention and so forth. So this is really impressive when you have this convergence of sign findings. So I think that this might be a way to uh, talk about skilled seemings in science, but it places the bar very high for skilled seemings. It's too impractical and it would exclude many of them. One way to look at how skilled seemings might provide a form of prima facie justification is I think if we look at it in the evolutionary and developmental contexts. There are some people, of course, who acquire skilled seemings totally as autodidacts, you'd say, but this is very rare. Even autodidacts, um, they uh, use books and YouTube and whatever means they can have, so they do use some form of social transmission, even not directly through teacher. So given that skills are socially transmitted, one obvious risk that you have is the risk of deception. I think here we can make a link with um, questions about the justification of testimony. So the worry about whether we should trust testimony is also somewhat, there is this worry that, okay, uh, how does it work? How can we trust testimony? Should we do it prima facie? So some extreme people like Tyler Burge have argued that even if testimony were wholly unreliable, and I forgot exactly how he came to that, that we could still somehow trust it. So he still has this sort of anti-reductionist sense. But most people who are anti-reductionist about testimony, such as Thomas Reed, thinks that there has to be something like trustfulness, that mostly testimony is truthful and that people who uh, receive testimony are trustful. And similarly, if we look at uh, skills, transmission of skills, uh, there could be a risk of deception. Uh, and this is a problem, a general problem in uh, looking at animal communication more broadly. Um, if communication is deceitful, then the whole communication can fall down, can tumble down. Now, one way to stop this is a mechanism by whereby it is more costly to fake, to fakely signal than to truthfully signal. And in fact, this is the case the transmission of skills. It is very difficult to bullshit your way. Well, I can bullshit my way through a philosophy paper. Maybe I can do a fairly good job, but it's very difficult. I mean, I'm not going to show you how to bake a cake, even if I've never done it in my life. Very difficult. Honesty has a byproduct advantage. Uh, Sir Romney gives the example of him being an Australian birder. He's truthfully and really an Australian birder. It took him lots of time to get that far. He had to invest in all sorts of stuff. He had to learn being a birder. But now he can cheaply signal that he's a birder. He can show you how it's done. It's easy for him to do this because he, in fact, knows how to do it. By contrast, suppose that you want to pretend that you're a birder. You'd have to at least, you have to go through costs that make no sense, like buying binoculars and you know, funny clothes, maybe, I don't know if birders wear funny clothes, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, and then you'd have to buy some or other birding guy to at least have names of birds that sound plausible. So you'd go through a lot of problems for no reason. So knowing how um, is a norm of skill transmission, uh, as Buckwalter and Turry have recently argued. So just they make this parallel between the knowledge norm of testimony. Um, so for testimony, there's this idea that in order for me to, test to, to, uh, to assert that something is the case, I have to know that it's the case. Uh, so this is a lot of debate about that, but it seems to be still the standard position. And similarly, if I want to show you how to do something, then the norm for that is that I actually know how to do it. It would be very strange for me to say, let me show you how to bake a cake, and I just have no idea how to do it. That would be strange. So it's a sort of Morian paradox for uh, knowing how. It's not just that. It's just very hard to feign to transmit a skill that you do not have. 
but it's easy to show and tell a skill that you do possess. So, I mean, obviously, this is just one aspect of uh, skilled seemings, but given that they have this social component, I think it's important uh, to get clear on that, that at least there's not this sort of huge risk of deceitful communication. Now, there might be the problem, and that's something that we will uh, look at maybe in Q&A. Maybe these people aren't deceiving you. Maybe they just really are believers, like astrologists. They really believe that the houses and whatever they're doing with their astrology charts, that there's really something going on. Maybe philosophy is just a big charade and philosophical intuitions are meaningless, but we are believers that it, it works. So this is a much deeper problem than the problem of deceitful communication. So how do we solve that? I don't know if this can be adequately solved, and if it isn't, then it's going to remain a deep and persistent problem. I think sometimes, well, in many cases, skilled seemings are functionally dependent on ordinary cases of perception or of seemings. For example, a car expert, um, a car expert who says this is an old mobile and this is a Pontiac. Well, even though you don't have the phenomenal evidence argument, you could still say, look, there's facial perception that lies at the basis of this. And facial perception works. So you sort of have this case where it's at least parasitic on that. That's not going to work for all skilled seeming, so it's going to work for a subset of them. And thirdly, skilled seemings are often part of a broader cultural skill set that is necessary for being an expert in that domain. So for example, suppose that you have a grandmaster who sees an end game and she thinks, the situation is hopeless for white. How does she do that? Well, the, the way of seeing what's going on in an end game is an important part of the total skill set of a successful chess player. So you know, for example, how a game is going to go. You know when there's really no point in dragging it out and you can just give up. So it's just part of the broader skill set. Um, and this is what makes this person a good chess player. So given that at least under these conditions, I think that skilled seemings have prima facie justification, I'm now going to say something briefly about philosophical intuitions. So I think that philosophical intuitions aren't a natural kind. Um, there's two kinds of philosophical intuitions. You have the intuitions that are ordinary seemings. And they just arise uh, as a result of the ordinary working of our everyday cognitive capacities. So there's lots of, uh, I think a lot of more cross-cultural experimental philosophy needs to be done to identify these. But one example are Gettier intuitions. I think there's a lot of good work done on Gettier intuitions. And even though initially it seemed like there were weird differences between genders and between cultures. It turns out that um, Machery et al., so they did it in several cultures, I forgot where, I think Brazil and several other places, that people attribute less knowledge in Gettier situations than in non Gettier uh, good situations. Uh, and uh, Nagel, San Juan, and Mar have similar, um, have similar results. And what they argue is that, in fact, Gettier intuitions are parasitic on, or th th they depend on our ordinary theory of mind. So we need to know what other people know and what other people are thinking. And additionally to that, Jennifer Nagel also thinks that, in line with other people such as Williamson, that knowledge is a separate mental state, separate from belief. And so if you are somehow lucky in knowing something, um, it doesn't count, well, lucky in believing something, it doesn't count as knowledge. And this might be very useful to know, to be able to track people's uh, beliefs and knowledge reliably. Um, so that's how uh, get your intuitions are formed. They're just ordinary seemings. But they're next to that philosophical intuitions that you only get as a result of really being in a specific domain um, for a long time. So historians, people who are really specialized in historical figures, such as the Kant scholar who wonders about the Kantian response to the current refugee crisis. Well, obviously, if you're not acquainted with the work of Kant, that's not going to happen. 
but if you're a Kant scholar, you can immediately say, yeah, well, this is what Kant would say. So now there's been a lot of discussion about ordinary seemings in philosophy. And in fact, it turns out that philosophers, there's no clear expertise effect. So there's all this work by Schwitzgebel on moral philosophers. Uh, and it turns out that moral philosophers are just as likely as other philosophers and as lay people to be influenced by framing effects when you have trolley problems. So it seems to be if you put push first or switch first, that people have different responses, which is strange because you would think that philosophers have thought about these things and yet they, they have different responses. Um, I think it's not surprising if they are dependent, these things are dependent on ordinary seemings. That's exactly what you should expect. I think, though, that expertise effects are going to be evident in skilled seemings, which just haven't been investigated. So it has first have to be clear on which kind of philosophical intuitions are skilled seemings. They're not just going to be, I think, uh, history of philosophy intuitions, but also, for instance, things to do with really remote, think like swamp man intuitions. I mean, I think that if you're not a philosopher of mind, you're not going to have clear swamp man intuitions. And even philosophers of mind should have really strong swamp man. And, oh, I see people shaking their heads. So maybe they have small, s strong swamp man intuitions. So are skilled seemings in philosophy justified uh, prima facie? Well, I think uh, we cannot rely on dogmatism or phenomenal evidence. Um, maybe these displays of discriminatory virtuosity. So it would be difficult to demonstrate what what a good philosophical intuition is. This is one of the problems that philosophy faces. There isn't a sort of external validation. You could see maybe there's a sort of consensus. Um, well, suppose that you're a Kant scholar and you have this seeming about what Kant would say about the Syrian refugee crisis. The problem is that you start writing up your paper, etc. So the cross-checking with other scholars comes <coughs> relatively late in the stage of research referee reports, feedbacks and conferences. So it isn't that clear to me if that's going to be helpful to philosophers. Besides, if you have a referee who says, I don't have that intuition, it's just not all that helpful. What are you going to do with it? It's just impractical. So I think maybe we can go for prima facie reasons for trust from evolutionary and developmental contexts that I outlined. Namely, well, suppose this Kant scholar who has these intuitions about the refugee crisis she learned the skill from others, such as her supervisor. The risk of deception was low, except if he's a really nasty supervisor and says all sorts of weird things. But nonetheless, she learned from so many different people, so many different sources. Um, it doesn't seem likely that there's deliberate deception. But then it could still be that people are somehow deeply wrong or misguided. Well, what you have in the case of the Kant intuitions, I think, is that there is at least a functional dependence on ordinary cases of seemings, such as mind reading. I mean, in everyday cases, we can say, what would my grandfather say about this? My grandfather passed away two years ago. But still, I mean, there was the referendum, for example, and he was always so into politics. And I thought, what would he say about it? And I thought, yeah, he'd say that about it. So if you say, what would Kant say something about this? It's basically using the sort of theory of mind skills. Um, and thirdly, having seemings about what Kant would have said are an essential part of the skill set that make you a competent and recognized Kant scholar so you can feel this good feeling of prima facie justification that what you think about what Kant would say about the refugee crisis is in fact what Kant would say, um, well, given that you are an expert in that field. Thank you.